the new climate economy report was launched at the UN in September. And of course, it's not limited to land use, but that is the part that I was involved with, and that's what I'll be addressing today. But you could say that the, the new climate economy took a deep dive in three sectors, primarily energy, cities, and land use. And land use, even more than energy and cities, brings in a lot of complications. It, it is really the interface, if you like, of climate change with the poor. Macroeconomic modeling, really across the board, shows quite clearly that the ones that really have skin in the game, so to speak, are poor rural people in the tropics. Those are the ones who really will be hurt in the first instance by climate change, both through their livelihood, their entitlements, their ability to grow things, raise things, and also through what they have to pay for subsistence. And one of the other aspects of land use that I think was surprising to my non-land use colleagues in NCE, and I'll try to build this case, is that you can get fairly fast, immediate progress in climate mitigation through land use by actually doing what you need to do for resilience and for productivity. And you can, in fact, get a third of the way. I'll try to build this case realistically by 2030, a third of the way of where you'd have to be to get to a two-degree pathway for, for global warming. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to do, and we'll see if it works. Let me go straight to the inconvenient facts, as Tom says, just to set the stage and then, then get as quickly as possible to what we might do. One of the inconvenient facts is that agriculture is one of the big perpetrators in greenhouse gas emissions, really the, the motor of climate change. And uh, I have to tell you, I'm actually a livestock guy from Arizona originally, so... <laughs> I have to tell you, a third, you know, you've, agriculture is more important to greenhouse gas emissions even than cutting down forests. And environmentalists typically have always worried about rainforests in the tropics, as they should. But agriculture on a global scale is actually accounts for an even higher share. A share, maybe about 13% agriculture alone of greenhouse gas emissions from all sources, which is on a par with transport. So, and of agriculture, really a lot of that comes, I mean, 30% of all agriculture and land use emissions, at least 30% comes from, from uh, livestock, and four-fifths of that are ruminant-related, and we'll come back to that. So as one of the great ruminant producers and exporters of the world, actually a very efficient producer in terms of greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of beef, there's, Ireland knows a lot about how you could have a huge impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions simply through technological change in other countries. That sort of gets the figures out there again. I don't want to dwell on them, but I'll come back to that. Oops, sorry. <coughs> One of, one of the things that, uh, you know, I moved from the World Bank to an environmental institute where I proceeded to r really raise the uh, mean age when I joined and also the mean body weight. <laughs> and one thing I found about my environmental colleagues who have been very, very uh, welcoming is that everyone not only is focused on forests being cut down, but they're not terribly focused on why they're being cut down. And, you know, if you want to do something about something, you have to know why. Wood removals are projected to triple by the World Wildlife Fund, which is one of the few organizations actually sponsored modeling, you know, in-depth database modeling of this. And although that's a contested figure, it's in an upper bound, by volume terms, that's six times the projected rate of growth of cereals production, uh, consumption, I should say, by 2050. That's a huge increase. In the OECD, demand for wood products and pulp is going down. Everyone's using their iPad. They're not reading newspapers. <laughs> but in places like China, where they're packing that iPad in a box, and where newspapers are going up in India and so forth, there's soaring demand. All the BRICS, all the emerging developing countries, huge growth in demand for wood. 
And that's not going away. This is one of the things that we have to understand the why to know what to do. Now, I come from an agricultural background, so I've always bridled at the fact that everyone is sure that those Aggies are behind it. In fact, this is a very reputable study by Gabrielle Kissinger and her friends looking at the drivers of deforestation. Now, one thing that the lay audience I didn't know before I got into this, but deforestation literally doesn't mean cutting trees. It means changing land use. Land that was forest becomes something else. And in fact, agriculture, both subsistence but primarily commercial, depending which part of the world you're in, is the primary driver of change in land use, which means that trees were there, they were cut, and then something else started happening there. We will see, though, that doesn't really get to the carbon loss and explaining the drivers of carbon loss. There's something else going on. Removal of trees, removal of biomass, however, these are the same authors, again, Africa, Latin America. The primary reason that trees are cut down is to get logs and pulp, except in Africa, where the primary driver is still fuel wood, fuel wood or charcoal. And the issue is if you don't want people to cut trees down, you've got to address what are you going to do instead. For the, for the use of those products. I'm not arguing for the use of paper. I'm just saying it's going to happen. Paper happens. It does happen. Oops. Oh, sorry. I've got a hair trigger here. So in the realm of inconvenient facts, before we get to solutions, let's look at reality. We're looking at 9.6 billion people, or thereabouts, by 2050, according to the UN. We have, we have potential demand for calories will go up faster than demand for cereals because you have diet change, and when you go over $2 a day in 2005 purchasing power dollars, you start diversifying your diet, which is a good thing at that for most people. You have, uh, so that means two times as much meat and dairy, three times as much log and pulp demand. You've got, you've got a lot of new pressures on resources, and we don't have these resources. That is the problem. We always have some resources at the margin, but on the whole, things are getting tighter. Food loss and waste, I mean, that's huge in the developed world, particularly in, at the retail side, in the developing world, more at the farm side and the early storage side. But a quarter of, of the food we produce actually is never eaten, at least a quarter, maybe as much as a third. This is a sorry picture from the stopping toms in my old stopping grounds, but uh, in the Sahel... According to the FAO, a quarter of the world's farmland is severely degraded to the point that you can't use it. And maybe another 8% is on its way, moderately degraded. And independent estimates of this in a number of countries really estimate the cost of this. It's you know, a significant cost, like up to 7% of world production, at least, every year. And the co the cost this cost is much greater than the cost of remediating it by several orders of magnitude. And so, this this is one of the greatest human tragedies that we can deal with. And so, when we go to countries that look like this, and we say we're here about climate change mitigation, they say get the heck out of here, you know. But this is this is the reality we're dealing with. So now, now we'll get away from, from, hopefully not from facts, but at least inconvenient ones, and let's talk about what can I... This is a, a slide, by the way, from Ethiopia, where you've got some forest restoration going on, and if you notice, those cattle don't look half bad. I, I can't imagine from my days traipsing around northern Ethiopia seeing anything that looked like that, so... Rural resilience to the poor is really the issue for the poor for climate change. If, you know, that, that is, as I say, the issue of the day. If you're going to have climate change, and if you're the one that really is affected by it, your ability to, be, to have your livelihoods, the livelihoods of poor rural people, 
in places like Burkina Faso and Niger, shown there in one of the earlier slides of degraded land, is absolutely key. And really, the literature is very clear. To get resilience, you have to sequester carbon in the soil, because most of these degraded soil, when a forester says land's degraded, it means the biomass has been cut. When an Aggie says the land's degraded, it means the soil has really lost the ability, lost fertility, and typically it means it's lost organic matter. It's leached out or it's acidified. And poor countries know this, but climate change in the whole domain of climate finance, for a variety of complicated reasons, adaptation is always the poor cousin. And climate adaptation for agriculture is really pitiful. I mean, we're talking about disbursements of something of the order of $50 million a year, <laughs> all told. And it's not that funds haven't been set up, it's just that we, haven't, we just don't have the, the pipelines set up to really handle this. And that means that we're, there's, we're just so far behind the curve. Uh, it really needs a, a total rethink and a total recommitment. And I certainly, for one, hope that understanding of this comes along through Paris and that we get the kind of concertation we got for dealing with the food crises uh, after 2008 and get some forward movement. To really move forward in developing countries with whether, whether you're, you want to save forests, whether you want to protect the livelihoods of the poor, it all comes down to really establishing the productive landscape and supporting it. There are all these competing demand and supply issues, there's all this poverty, there's all these other concerns, but at the end of the day you keep on coming back to the three aspects of climate smart agriculture or climate smart forestry, basically productivity, resilience, and as sort of a byproduct almost, mitigation. Those three go together. And one of the problems of land use compared to the other sectors is there's tremendous skepticism by the main stakeholders that in fact the three go together. People think, yes, productivity, we want it. Resilience, clearly. But, you know, mitigation, that's someone else's. Someone else caused the problem. Why are we going to get involved in that? In fact, the three go together. And for productivity, the game has changed now. Compared to the Green Revolution era, where you were basically picking the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, by taking dwarfing varieties of the main cereals so that they wouldn't lodge in the tropics and so they could use fertilizer better and water better. Nowadays, it's much more about traits, and including traits, climate change adds the need for drought resistance, other kinds of traits, uh, pest resistance. You have to use all the, the tools in your box to speed things up, including marker-assisted selection, which is not transgenic, it's conventional breeding, but it just makes it happen a lot faster. And that is happening now. And it's particularly happening for rice, which is still what feeds almost all of Asia is fed by rice. Uh, I can go into this for any skeptics later in the question period if they want, but, but that's my belief. Ruminant and related emissions are more than 6% of global greenhouse gases, and they can be cut by about half, according to FAO estimates. And we know how to do it. We know the kinds of pasture improvements that do it, grazing. Now, if any farmers here are there any farmers here? A farmer would say, okay, but who's going to pay me to do that? If I've got to spend money, I'm not getting any premium for doing it your way or the other way or whatever. And that's, that's a reason, that's actually not entirely true because if you're being more productive, it, some, of, some of this, according to FAO estimates, will pay for itself. But by and large, if you're talking about Indian dairy or so forth, you know, that's a, it's a valid question. And, you know, we spend 600, more than $600 billion a year in fossil fuel subsidies, primarily in develop, developing countries. That, that's a lot of money. And as the fossil fuel prices are, happen to be low right now, there should be a discussion of if you're going to subsidize stuff, what you're subsidizing, what you're trying to achieve with that kind of fiscal incentive. 
for the livestock guys, these are the FAO figures. The figures you see are the kilos of, of greenhouse gas and, and CO2 equivalents per kilo of beef produced by region. Ireland's one of the, one of the stars here. Low, low amount of emissions per kilo because you're very efficient beef producers and you have very good pastures and so forth. But there's a tremendous amount, and if you, if you could apply even, even marginal changes in the rest of the world where the livestock industry is rapidly shifting, you would have tremendous savings of greenhouse gas. And, and, and where the, the, the good producers have an awful lot to offer to the less good producers. And particularly, although Ireland is a great exporter, believe me, livestock industries are going to be growing elsewhere particularly dairy will be growing elsewhere. And there's, there's a tremendous benefit for Ireland being more involved in that process. Governance and tech, we're in a new world of technology. Brazil has really done marvels at stopping deforestation on larger plots, simply because starting in 2004, Brazilian government decided that the advantages of stopping illegal logging in the Amazon were much better than, the, than just not doing it. And with the uh, satellite overhead pictures being freely available, the Brazilians set up a shed with 150 analysts in it, and they got the, the monthly satellite overpass things from the, from the U.S., and they examined them by... 150 analysts every month, and they could see where deforestation was occurring. It went to the police. Police sent out helicopters. They stopped it. And in Brazil, there was a tremendous decrease, about three quarters, in deforestation, at least on larger plots. At least it's, maybe it's shifting to smaller plots the satellites couldn't see. But now the satellites can see down to six hectares, Resolution. In fact, they can see down to a meter if you're talking about military satellites, but the, the commonly available ones, uh, six hectares. And if you go, and this is a, a plug for my own institute, mm -hmm. which houses a thing called Global Forest Watch at globalforestwatch.org, anybody can sign up for an alert in, in every 16 days for deforestation on any plot of six hectares or smaller. So that means that Wilmar which handles 40% of the trade, world trade in palm oil, can actually check up on its suppliers. And it means that if civil society wants to hold companies responsible, they can do it, and the companies can make commitments because they can enforce them, and that's what they're doing. That's what Unilever is doing, that's what Wilmar is doing, others. They can actually, they can actually make sure they don't get embarrassed. So technology, the technology of transparency is going up, and that gives a lot of hope for dealing with the governance issues in land use that we're producing things like illegal deforestation. Why are you going to do things sustainably if you can do them for free on public land and do it unsustainably? One of the, one of the key solutions that we can commit to is to restore 150 million hectares of degraded agricultural landscapes. That's a big area. There are basically two ways to do it. The way that we used to do it in the World Bank when I was there, which is big capital and skill intensive projects. Jürgen Vogelay, who spoke to you, is probably one of the world's experts in this. He did it. He, he was the young TTL who started something called the China's Los Plateau Project in his day. And at the very most, you could get a million hectares a year from this. So it's capital intensive, skill intensive. Or you can go a different route, which I'll talk, farmer managed natural regeneration, which I'll talk about in a moment. This is the Los Plateau in 1990 and now, more or less now. You see, it can be done. It's absolutely amazing. You get the triple wins, they're measured. There's, there's really... One of the things people don't know about this, by the way, is that it was a livestock project. And that's where you get real gains in this business, is where you associate there's something in it for the farmer. These people here had goats, which produced that, but they couldn't, they couldn't make any money, really. And they could barely survive. They were going to have to leave the land altogether. 
Now, what they, they don't have goats anymore because they're prohibited. They had to be confined, but they have confined dairy and they have uh, confined Kashmiri sheep in there in the wool business. And they're doing quite well and their incomes went up. Economic rates of return were quite high for this project, even with all the capital intensity. So it shows that when you get your act together, everybody can be better off. In Latin America, you had silvopastoral systems, which in Central America, I should say, which again, it's raising cattle in forests. It's actually a very capital intensive uh, venture from the farmer's standpoint. It's not something that just happens by itself. But as once, once the system is put in place, Again, there's something in it. You've, you've internalized the value of ecosystem services from that forest, and you're getting a good chunk of that back in the farmer's pocket. And so people comply, and it actually works, and everyone's better off. This is Niger, 1980s. That's the same, the same landscape in 2013. That has, and it's, that's not a before the rainy season, after the rainy season picture, which is the usual way of doing this. But it, it, is, it is really, it is uh, amazing. What happened there, there was a change in the forest code that, that meant that instead of farmers sneaking out at night and cutting down state trees to the root, they actually had some advantage in letting them grow, keeping them there. And that regreening got the cereal yields up by 100 kilos uh, a hectare, and it, it had a lot of other advantages. Now, you need to put a lot of acreage under that to get any real impact uh, at scale for climate mitigation. But you can do this on hundreds of millions of hectares. And the total investment in this, from the fiscal point of view, was 20 US dollars a year over about a 30-year period. It was not a huge amount. So this is, this is the way of doing it on the cheap, <coughs> but you can do it on very large areas. You have to take all the themes that you have, really. Another solution now, getting back to forests, where you get the big biomass, the immediate big impact, you have the New York Declaration on Forests that came out in the summit in September. And the whole, the whole issue with forest policy is the opportunity cost of land. Land is not free. You know, one, one of the problems with a lot of the stuff that we put out on the sort of environmental advocacy stuff, we always assume that, that land resources are free. They're not. They, they have value to people, particularly poor people. And many of the benefits that come from taking land that's not for us now and restoring it is, in fact, ecosystem services that are a benefit to a much broader group than the local community. To make something like the New York Declaration work, it has to really be a mix of agroforestry, a mix of mosaic, that is you reforest the degraded upper slopes so that you have water, better water retention for low down. And it has to be, there is a component of full forest. It can be done, oops. I'm ending up now, I wanna, I, this is what I wanted to, to really get across. This, this uh, I'm getting the negative influence of McKinsey, you see, in my slides. It's sort of beginning to, to creep in. But really, the, the three things on the left is where you get, you get the big impact. This is to 2030. Those are gigatons of CO2e. That is a measure, if you like, of greenhouse gas mitigation. And you have lots of things from agriculture, from food waste prevention, and things that make a difference. But those, that's, those are feasible ranges from cutting down on, on uh, illegal logging, forest restoration, agricultural land restoration. These are things we know how to do, they can do. We just have to do them, and they pay for themselves mostly. And though, here's from the NCE main report. These are, the, that's the same information in, inside the red circle you saw detailed in the previous slide. You'll see how land use stacks up relative to all the other things you can do in this globe to go from the 68 gigatons baseline, which is projected what you will have, it's not what we have now, but what we'll have under business as usual by 2030, 
to get it down to what you need, the red line is what is projected for a two degree pathway by 2030. And you see that land use really has to be part of the solution. Land use interventions are between 15 and 35 percent of the mitigation you need. There's no way to just sort of say, well, we're going to talk about something else or we'll kick the can down the road. You simply cannot reach a two degree path now without a greater push on land use. You may still not reach it, but, but there's no way to reach it if you don't have a big push on land use. And if you've got the you've got most of the land in the world in developing countries that say it's not our problem for our agriculture, why should we, why should we sacrifice productivity and resilience to worry about your problem here of climate change? You've got a problem because, and really the only way around that problem is to do things in the way that they have to do them anyway and help them do them, to really have productive landscape restoration, which is what they need for survival anyway. The details, you see new climate economy report, this, if you leave off the upslash part, you don't have to look at just land use, but you can find the entire report. Or if you have any problems, send me an email. I'll send you a link. Thank you.